Good morning. Good morning, everyone who chose to join us this morning, the Zoom conference. It is my goal to have a conversation with you today and to share a perspective on race, science, and health that has been developed and refined throughout my career. As I reviewed a talk that I was asked to give as a guest speaker at Sarasota Memorial Hospital during Black History Month in 2019, there seemed to be many parallels to the information that we have learned from David Wilkins as it relates to antebellum South, the Civil War, and the Reconstructive Period. I was asked during that lecture to speak to the relationship between the American Medical Association and the National Medical Association, and why that relationship was important in a discussion about diversity. That discussion was really a study of the reconstructive period, reconstruction period through the lens of health, race, and an evolving medical profession. After the discussions that we have had about the reconstruction period from the historical the legal and the political perspective, I would like to explore with you today the early developments of the African American presence in the medical profession and how it was impacted by the Reconstruction period. Before any further remarks, I must extend major kudos to David Wilkins for the quality of his lecture series and the time that he has invested so that we all are a little more knowledgeable than before. And we're also better friends than before because we have these chats before the lectures. And I also want to make sure that I thank those who have made it possible for me to be with you today and to provide technical support for my presentation. Minnesota Asala President Jim Stewart, Linda Crump, Lois Wilkins, Marion Black Ruffin, of course, David um, Wilkins, and my wife, Karen Morgan. So after a comprehensive course given by David Wilkins on the Reconstructive Period, for any question that is asked of me to explain the plight of Black America today, I would give the same answer that my oldest daughter gave when she was in elementary school. It does all go back to slavery. Sadly, that's our health status today for black and brown people. It is a result of a pattern developed in slavery and solidified through the Reconstruction period. As we begin, I would first like to reflect on the current situation in the United States and why the Reconstruction period was so important. We are confronted with health and healthcare disparities every day as patients, physicians, and members of the healthcare ecosystem. That includes hospitals, the, the ancillary services, the pharmaceutical industry, and the payers. The reconstruction period was a part of a lifelong, of a long pipeline and the journey to longevity and the right to healthy lives for blacks. The seeds of knowledge with respect to health and the Negro race were planted during the Reconstruction period, but did not bloom for over a half century, and in fact are still blooming. Equity in health and equity in the health professions remains aspirational over 150 years after the Reconstruction period. Over 120 years following the Emancipation Proclamation, it took a study commissioned by Margaret M. Heckler, the Secretary of Health and Human Services under President Reagan, to discover what was known during the time of slavery and reconstruction in the North and the South, that black health was markedly inferior to that of whites. The report was written for the most part by an African-American scientist and Deputy Director, Dr. Thomas E. Malone. A result of this report was the establishment of the Office of Minority Health and increased activities and focused activities by CDC 
and the Agency for Healthcare <coughs> Quality Research. Racial and ethnic health disparities and a black health crisis were acknowledged for the first time by a conservative United States administration, the administration of Ronald Reagan. Blacks were much more likely to die from preventable causes than whites. This was the key finding in this report that set uh, the Congress in place to develop many, many studies to solve the problem. Health disparities were publicly recognized for the first time. This is a quote in the foreword of the American Health Dilemma, volume two by my colleagues, Michael Byrd and Linda Clayton. And it was a very powerful statement and I think I have it totally correct. And I'm gonna take the liberty of, of reading it uh, because of its import. Slavery is America's original sin, a political analyst once observed, and racism is its chronic disease. It is a compelling description and yet insufficient. Dispassionate terms such as chronicity are inadequate to convey the reality of more than three centuries of continuous violations of the American creed of equality. Violations expressed cumulatively in millions of premature deaths, in uncounted episodes of human suffering, both physical and emotional, and in repeated assaults on human dignity. To think of racism as a disease, similarly, is a useful metaphor, but again, such a metaphor is inadequate to define the reality of a moral outrage that is still sadly built into the very fabric of American society. Race and class, deeply confounded from the beginnings, have been among the most powerful structural determinants of the American social order. I think this statement brings us exactly to real time and our concern about the social determinants of health. The founding of the Cobb Institute in 2004 gave me the opportunity to focus more closely upon health disparities. This immediately followed the groundbreaking report of the Institute of Medicine in 2003 entitled Unequal Treatment that showed that even with corrections for many of the social and financial factors as possible, there remain major discrepancies in health outcomes for black and brown people in the United States. This has not changed. So let me take this point in time to introduce myself to some of you who may not know me. Uh, I am from Gary, Indiana. I practiced orthopedic surgery for 31 years in Gary, Indiana and in Evanston, Illinois. I then moved to Sarasota and have continued to practice for 15 years. So this is my 46th year of practice of orthopedic surgery. But I also have been very involved in health disparities and in service to the National Medical Association, which began 30 years ago. And I became the 96th president of the National Medical Association in 1996. Subsequent to that, and upon the time I moved to Sarasota, I was asked to be the inaugural executive director of the W. Montague Cobb National Association Med uh, Health Disparities and Health uh, Equity Institute. I have thus served in that role for 15 years. And it has been quite a, a ride, I will say. Um, and we feel that we've made a difference and we hope that we can make even more of a difference in this community and across the United States and the world. So my objectives today are to talk first and identify the origins of the medical profession in Black Americans. And then to describe the state of health for Blacks before, during, and after the Civil War period. 
then try to understand the role of the reconstructive, reconstruction period in defining black scientists and physicians, and to appreciate the legacy of the struggles of blacks in science during the post reconstruction period. W. Montague Cobb was born in 1904 and died in 1990. He's a native of Washington, D.C. He was, of course, the person for whom the Cobb Institute was named. He was a past president of the National Medical Association and actually was president in 1965 when Medicare and Medicaid came on board. But he was much more than that. He was the editor of the Journal of the National Medical Association, and he was also a distinguished professor at Howard University School of Medicine. He was, in fact, my professor in anatomy, and little did I know when I was taking anatomy from him in medical school in 1965 that his night job or other day job was lobbying Congress and pushing forth with Medicare and Medicaid. Dr. Cobb was also the first African American to receive a PhD Muted, in yeah. anthropology. Muted. Muted. And as a result, he had a great influence on many of his students when we talk about the uh, evolution of man and the importance of uh, the black race. Dr. Cobb taught us about Imhotep, the god of wisdom and medicine, mm -hmm. who built the first pyramids. Mm -hmm. Imhotep was the first physician and was also black. He lived around 2980 BC and was the chief physician for Pharaoh Zoster. He was a major founder of Egyptian medicine, which prevailed for over 2,500 years. And there is an observation that was made that Blacks really were the originators of modern medicine. And many of the um, accomplishments of the time of e Egyptian physicians, including even the writing of prescriptions and the uh, use of the skilled exam and sound evidence um, was way ahead of its time, but it shows that the black race has just been dormant in terms of leadership and medicine and health until really around the time of the Civil War and the Reconstruction. Of interest is that during the time of the Egyptians, race was not a factor in the Egyptian health system. Dr. Dorothy Roberts of the University of Pennsylvania spoke about race medicine, and some of us may have heard about race medicine. Essentially, there's always been the exist existence of racism and the desire to dominate. European scientists and physicians had to invent races and define inferiority. Um, this had its rebirth around the time, actually, of the antebellum period and the um, Reconstruction period. The hierarchy required that Europeans be on the top of any evolution theory. In America, Blacks were deemed property and could be used and be forced uh, to participate in any type of medical experiment or torture without consent. The subordinate group also, of course, gets inferior medical care, or as Dr. Martin Luther King said, a um, check that is uh, non-sufficient funds. From the time the slaves arrived, there was a real concern about smallpox. And so that the advertisements that you see here from Boston uh, for a cargo of about 250 fine, healthy Negroes essentially meant that none had smallpox. This was unusual for the arrival of, uh, for those slaves that did arrive. And one of the early medical um, 
specialist uh, among the slaves was Onesimus. And Onesimus was uh, in 1706 purchased by Cotton Mather in Boston. And Cotton Mather felt that Onesius, Onesimus was very bright, but sometimes he felt that Onesimus asked too many questions and, and got out of his place. So uh, Onesimus in 1716 presented to Cotton Mather a, an idea which he had to stop smallpox. And of course, uh, initially um, this was met with uh, many questions. However, what Onesimus did was he placed pus from an infected person uh, in a wound on his own arm because he felt that he would inoculate himself to uh, not be infected by smallpox. And this was something that actually did create immunity in many slaves and others. And when there was the Boston smallpox epidemic in 1721, uh, <clears throat> there, um, smallpox entered on the slave ships uh, from both uh, Africa and from the Caribbean and was passed on to the colonists uh, that they encountered. Native Americans had no immunity and uh, they died in great number. Long before medical schools uh, existed for Blacks, there were Black physicians. Lucas Santamy was a Dutch-trained Dutch Black uh, physician and land uh, owner who practiced in New Amsterdam. Uh, he was free, he was wealthy, and was successful. This was around the time of 1644. James Durham, uh, in Philadelphia was a slave who was sold. He was found to uh, be quite bright. Uh, he was sold to a doctor from New Orleans in 1788. He moved to New Orleans uh, with this doctor who was a surgeon and the surgeon taught him medicine and surgery. He became so skilled that he was able to buy his own freedom. And for a while he moved back to Philadelphia uh, to practice. Papan was a Virginia slave who learned medicine from his masters and became a skin specialist. And uh, Caesar was enslaved in South Carolina and was given freedom due to his medical expertise. Primus was a slave doctor and, and a pioneer in the treatment of rabies. Uh, notice the uh, importance of infectious disease because those were the primary diseases of this time. Early African American slaves who were slaves, uh, early African American slaves were also slave midwives, root doctors, and of course, spiritual leaders from the, uh, from the African uh, legacy. The time period of 1680 to 1710, um, during that time, there was a growth of plantations and the growth of wealth through agriculture, as we have learned. Black slaves became the mass market agricultural workforce for the massive plantation system. Approximately one fifth of all were, of the population were blacks. And however, their health services were quite deficient. And this became known as the slave health subsystem that matured during this time. Thus the term slave health deficit was born and was coined by Byrd and Clayton. So what occurred during the period of time 1820 to 1920? Uh, I have referred you uh, uh, to the American health dilemma. I'm sure some of you have, have seen it or referred to it, but it is a seminal um, uh, treatise uh, by colleagues, um, Michael Byrd and Linda Clayton, who are obstetricians and public health professionals. They are senior fellows in our Cobb Institute and um, wonderful friends for many years. They are superb historians. And this book is a lifetime uh, work achievement for them and it was published in 2000. 
the African Americans have always suffered different and worse health status and outcomes, uh, initially manifesting itself as a slave health deficit. American society has always viewed blacks as being different biologically and physiologically, uh, providing rationales for the contended well cared for slave myth with the justification of poor black health, therefore a tiered system. Uh, as I mentioned, there has been a, a significant impact of communicable diseases upon the black population in America, smallpox, uh, tuberculosis, uh, influenza, syphilis. However, it was noted that, that blacks, as you might guess, were immune to uh, malaria. Uh, and that, of course, is because of the fact that uh, it was indigenous um, in um, Africa. So who were the providers of health for the slaves since they were not being provided care? There was minimal use of true physicians for the slaves by the masters. Uh, so the black slave healers provided the bulk of the care. Again, we talked about uh, conjure me, and I had to look up all these <clears throat> these terms, um, but there that means a witch doctor. And slaves, nurses, and midwives, and root doctors. But often the slave chose the African healing tradition. They were very suspicious of the care that could be provided by the physician of the master and they felt that there was no concern uh, for them anyway. So even in that time, slaves were concerned about clinical trials. Uh, talented uh, healer chattel uh, or slaves were often paid for their services, particularly when they were provided uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the families of, of the slave holders. Some southern physicians were contracted for care for the plantation uh, slaves <clears throat> as a part of the plantation health system. <clears throat> but as I mentioned, the slaves often resented that care. Now the population of the United States with regard to African Americans uh, uh, exploded. In 1619, there were 20. By 1790, 757,000. By 1800, 1 million, 1821 1,771,000. And by the time of the Civil War, 4.4 million <clears throat> African Americans. 488,000 or 10% were free. And in 1900, that population had doubled to 8,800,000. To put this in perspective, <clears throat> the state of Florida has a population of 22 million. And of that, there are approximately 3.6 million who are African Americans. So there are almost as many African Americans in the state of Florida. And certainly if you add uh, Georgia, there are more than were present in the entire United States in 1860. Yet the health care was abysmal during that time, and these individuals had no formal health care whatsoever. Scientific racism um, was rampant during the 1800s. The assumption of mental inferiority of Negroes, physiological differences, the brain was smaller, the skulls were smaller, um, and these assumptions created um, great problems for uh, blacks in this um, country. Um, however, um, the uh, Northern medical schools uh, would admit a few Negroes um, and DeGrasse was the first uh, member of the Negro, uh, I'm sorry, of the uh, Medical Society of Massachusetts. Um, he was the first Negro member in 1854. That is of importance in further uh, discussions in this talk today. This was a part that was very um, enlightening for me that uh, the slaves' children's health. 
childhood was the least healthy stage of a, of a slave's life. They were often poorly clothed, often poor, poorly protected. There were high rates of mortality, uh, morbidity, and injury among the enslaved children. Um, they were only given one half portions of food. The slaveholder desire to care for children was tempered by their desire for profit. Um, the slaveholder's desire for a high birth rate and high enough survival was seemingly antithetical to this um, behavior or somewhat neglect of, of children. Uh, but I think that it was that the idea was they could not spend the resources to keep the children healthy. Um, so we, they just had to have the, uh, the women continue to have children and hope the numbers worked out. Physicians in the era took little interest in childhood ailments, as I mentioned. Doctors were focused upon their care of the adult slaves who were ill. In 2006, Harriet Washington, a medical ethicist, uh, released Medical Apartheid. And this is sort of the co-anchor book with um, uh, Bird and Clayton uh, in speaking about the dark history of medical experimentation on Black Americans. Enslaved African Americans were more vulnerable to respiratory infections due to poorly constructed slave shacks, admitting cold and heat to a greater excess. Uh, the immune system, which we spoke of with regard to malaria, by the time 200 years had passed, was quite uh, different. It was very uh, inadequate, and it was challenged by all types of bacteria, parasites, and a consistently filthy environment. And physicians were active participants in the exploration of these African American bodies at the same time. So that brings us to J. Marion Sims, the father of gynecology and a slave woman named Lucy. Uh, J. Marion Sims is actually still revered as, a, as the father of gynecology. But he purchased slave women to operate on them. And he did multiple surgeries on the same patient. Imagine 20 to 30 surgeries on one patient. And most of his surgery was vesco-vaginal surgery. Uh, he did not use anesthesia because he felt blacks did not feel pain. And um, interestingly enough, there are still articles in the literature which show difference in care for blacks in emergency facilities and blacks with sickle cell disease because it was felt that they were not in pain or they reacted differently to pain. His surgical skills and his notoriety was gained at the expense of slave women. I'm gonna share with you a, uh, a, uh, a video. At the edge of Central Park in Manhattan, there's a bronze statue of a doctor named James Marion Sims, whose brilliant achievement carried the fame of American surgery throughout the entire world. He's the guy who created the vaginal speculum, an instrument gynecologists use for examination. He pioneered the surgical repair for fistula, a complication from childbirth, and became known as the father of modern gynecology. But that brilliant achievement was the result of a series of excruciating experimental surgeries that he conducted on enslaved women. In a lot of ways, Sims epitomizes the story of American medicine for black women. It's a system
system that's failing them to this day. From infant mortality to life expectancy, the racial disparities in healthcare are staggering. The gulf between black and white might be widest when we look at maternal mortality, with black women three to four times more likely to die in connection with pregnancy or birth than white women. And that divide can be traced back to doctors like Sims, who contributed to a long, largely overlooked history of institutional racism in medicine. Trying to understand a historical problem without knowing its history is like trying to treat a patient without eliciting a thorough medical history. You're doomed to failure. That's Harriet Washington, a medical ethicist and author who chronicled the intersection of race and medicine in her book, Medical Apartheid. While many of the stark racial disparities in healthcare can be attributed to environmental and economic factors like access to good healthcare, studies show that minority patients tend to receive a lower quality of care than non-minorities, even when they have the same types of health insurance or the same ability to pay for care. As African Americans, we've been abused for so long, consistently by the system, why should we trust it? Why should we go to it when ill? And that's iatrophobia. That's a fear of the healer, you know, inculcated by the behavior of those healers, unfortunately. It starts with slavery. Doctors relied on slave owners for financial stability. They accompanied plantation masters to auctions to verify the fitness of slaves and were called in to treat sick slaves to protect their owners' investments. In 1807, Congress abolished the importation of slaves and in turn pushed black women to have more children, to essentially breed slaves. Founding father Thomas Jefferson later wrote, I consider a woman who brings a child every two years as more profitable than the best man on the farm. Around the 1830s, the abolitionist movement led to the rise of what was called Negro medicine, or efforts to identify black inferiority to justify slavery. And there were polygenists who tried to use both science and the Bible to find proof that races evolved from different origins. The 1830s also marked the beginning of recorded experimentation on black women's bodies. One doctor performed experimental C-sections on slaves. Another one perfected the dangerous ovariotomy, or removal of an ovary by testing the procedure on slave women. In fact, half the original articles in the 1836 Southern Medical and Surgical Journal dealt with experiments on black people. And then, of course, there was James Marion Sims, whose reputation is etched in history and on that statue in Central Park. Between 1845 and 1849, Sims began performing experimental surgeries on a 17-year-old slave named Anarka. He eventually performed 30 operations on Anarka and more surgeries on about 11 other female slaves. When his male colleagues could no longer bear to assist him in inflicting pain on the women, the slaves took turns restraining one another. Yet paintings depicting Sims, Anarka, and other slave women presented a subdued version of his experiments. Even though anesthesia was introduced in 1846, Sims chose not to use it for his experimentation with slaves. His practices echoed one of the most prevalent and dangerous beliefs in medicine at the time, that black people did not feel pain or anxiety. This book from 1851, titled The Natural History of Human Species, claimed the American dark races bear with indifference, tortures insupportable to a white man. Studies released as recently as last year demonstrate that black people are less likely to be treated for pain, particularly in the ER. There's even one from a children's hospital that found the same to be true for kids. And just this year, Pearson Education, a leading educational publisher, issued an apology and recalled nursing textbooks that included racist stereotypes, like this section that said black people often report higher pain intensity than other cultures. Well, what does it mean when you say that someone doesn't feel pain? Among other things, you're speaking about their humanity. These are all part of that suite of beliefs emanating from the 19th century that we still have not shaken off. Despite all our knowledge and sophistication, they're deeply ingrained. Doctors like Sims might fit the Dr. Frankenstein stereotype, but they weren't outliers. Historically, Southern doctors who used black bodies for troubling experiments were the norm. It's a very common question. How can we judge our forebears? You know, those guys in the 18th century who practiced medicine in a way that appalls us today. You know, we think, how could you do that? I did not judge the practitioners based on our own ethics. I judged them based on the ethics of their time. It was not acceptable back then. We just did not hear from the people who protested against it. 
After the Civil War ended, the 1900s brought a wave of immigrants to the U.S. It sparked a race panic and coincided with the birth of the American eugenics movement. One of the movement's key objectives was to reduce the childbearing potential of the poor and disabled. Leaders included birth control pioneer and Planned Parenthood founder Margaret Sanger, who eventually devised the controversial Negro Project, or family planning centers that pushed birth control in the Black South. It was a project that even garnered support from W.E.B. Du Bois, a founder of the NAACP, who wrote that Black people bred carelessly and disastrously. By the mid-1930s, more than half the states passed pro-sterilization laws, and often sterilization was forced. In 1961, future civil rights leader Fannie Lou Hamer went to the hospital to have a tumor removed, but was subjected to a hysterectomy without consent. The procedure, which rendered women infertile without their knowledge, was so common in the South that Hamer is said to have dubbed it the Mississippi appendectomy. African-American babies were no longer economically valuable. And African-Americans themselves had gone from being a resource to a nuisance. In June of 1973, the SPLC uncovered 100 to 150,000 cases of women who had been sterilized with federal funds in Alabama. Half the women were black. In recent decades, women of color continue to be exposed to dubious reproductive health programs. In December 1990, the FDA approved a contraceptive called Norplant, and it was selectively marketed to black teenagers in Baltimore schools. You know, one of the current birth control methods now in the United States is Norplant. Norplant fans like David Duke, the former KKK Grand Wizard, even introduced legislation to give women on welfare an annual reward of $100 if they agreed to get Norplant. And it's time we start to encourage welfare mothers to be responsible. That bill never passed, but the implant ignited a debate on whether long-term contraception, like Norplant that lasted five years, could be used as a form of social engineering when pushed to specific communities. Today, as we continue to lose black mothers at alarming rates, a deeper look at the past may be a good step towards creating a more equitable healthcare system. Hi guys, thanks for watching. Of course The uh, statue, I was asked whether it still exists, and the statue was moved uh, by order of the mayor uh, in New York in, I think, May of 2018. It actually was moved to the cemetery in Brooklyn where J. Marion Sims is, is buried. On the plantations, there was a problem with regard to the older slave. And from the inception of slavery through modern times, those who grew old uh, had to withstand a variety of psychologically, physical, and sociologically degrading experiences. Um, and the economic interest, again, of the uh, uh, slave owners in the antebellum period was the production of the uh, slave and being able to work and being able to provide economic uh, return so that the children were at risk and the older um, slaves were at risk. But according to Frederick Douglass, youth were expected to respect the older slaves lest they risk severe reprimand. A young slave must approach the company of an older with hat in hand and woe betide him if he fails to acknowledge a favor of any sort with the accustomed tanky. The lifespan in the 19th century for African Americans uh, was uh, remarkably short. In 1850, some estimates placed the average longevity at 21.4 years of age, with the average longevity for whites at 25.5. So there was not that much difference between blacks and whites, but certainly the fact that uh, so many of the young uh, blacks um, did not live 
um, I think affected uh, and lowered that death rate. Um, or shall I say, uh, uh, the, lowered the longevity. Uh, by 1900, there had been some improvement with regard to the longevity of blacks. Um, and perhaps this was as a result of some of the advances that occurred in the medical fields following the reconstruction period. At that time, the expectation for Negro females was to live 35 years and for males, 32.5 years compared with the 51 years and 48 years for white females and males respectively. So that whites became much healthier after uh, the reconstruction. Um, with regard to medical education for blacks, uh, blacks faced much greater obstacles that mirrored the problems uh, they encountered in everyday life. Physicians in the North openly denied Blacks for admission to their profession. Uh, they learned by being apprentices. In the South, Blacks were sometimes permitted to practice, as I spoke of, these herbal remedies on their fellow slaves, but very seldom on the general population. And they were certainly not allowed to read or write and therefore were not qualified for formal uh, medical instruction. The first um, African-American to actually be awarded a medical degree was James McCune Smith. And this uh, a degree was awarded uh, from the University of Glasgow in Glasgow, Scotland, uh, because he had been turned down by all of the medical schools in the United States. The uh, first medical schools, including the University of Pennsylvania and uh, others were uh, approximately uh, the middle of the 18th century, uh, around 1750, 1760. So that uh, during 80 years afterwards, there were still no admissions of blacks to medical school. Um, and as many of these uh, physicians, um, he was an author, he was an abolitionist. Uh, so they were like every man, they had careers, and then they transform themselves through apprenticeships uh, to be uh, physicians, or they um, were excellent students, uh, and they literally forced themselves upon the uh, medical profession. The first African American to receive uh, the MD degree from a United States medical school was David Jones Peck in um, uh, 1847. Um, from Rush Medical School in Chicago. Um, he practiced in Philadelphia, and then in 1848, he started to practice in Philadelphia. It was not successful. He moved to Pittsburgh in uh, 1850 and had difficulty at that time so that these individuals were educated, they were credentialed, but they still could not attract patients and they had no access to any of the uh, um, hospitals and other kinds of facilities. Um, so in many cases they had medical degrees but they were terribly underused. It also seems that many of these early physicians had very short lifespans and uh, David Jones Peck died of an accidental trauma after he had moved to Nicaragua uh, where he, he migrated to, to practice uh, medicine. And uh, so he was not alone in terms of uh, an early death. Um, John DeGrasse uh, graduated from Bowdoin's uh, College's Medical School of Maine in 1849, therefore being the second African-American to receive a medical degree in the United States. Um, <clears throat> I think this is interesting. Between 1850 and 1860, um, according to the historian William Henry Ferris, he was regarded the most cultural, cultured, and accomplished Black in the world, meaning that he had um, significant classical knowledge as well as knowledge in science. So he was almost overqualified for his position. Uh, he became the first Black to join a U.S. Medical Society, admitted to the Massachusetts Medical Society 
1854. This will have <clears throat> an importance when we talk a little later about the AMA, uh, the American Medical Association. Um, and he, like a few others, was commissioned as an officer and assistant surgeon <clears throat> with the 35th United States Colored Infantry in 1864. Um, he had actually volunteered his services um, to President Lincoln, um, but he was unable to, to serve um, the, the uh, white Union soldiers uh, because of two problems. One, the, the Union soldiers really did not not feel comfortable having a black physician or surgeon, and two, the, the white surgeons were extremely jealous and particularly those who were uh, qualified better than they. Again, he died of tuberculosis at an early age, at age 43. In 1849, Elizabeth Blackwell became the first woman to obtain a medical degree in the United States. So there's a parallel between African Americans who actually uh, began to uh, obtain degrees in medicine prior to white women. She was accepted uh, at Geneva College um, in rural New York for medical school after multiple uh, rejections with the uh, uh, larger and more well-known uh, medical schools. But she did graduate first in her class, which shouldn't be uh, a revelation for those of us who understand the intelligence of women. And um, she trained nurses for the Union hospitals during the Civil War. Uh, many of the early women in medicine uh, actually uh, began as nurses, um, and many of them had to return almost to the nursing field, even though they had medical degrees, uh, because there was such discrimination with regard to women. So what's the Black health status during the Civil War? Well, it was worse than it was before the war. The Southern plantations lost the resources for health, and as the war carried on, um, they were torn asunder. So there was no health for the, um, uh, all, for the um, masters and the master's family, and there was certainly no health resources available for blacks. So the Union uh, soldiers, when they, when they did um, um, flee, cross the line, and become soldiers, were not as healthy as the other soldiers. And they suffered significantly higher mortality. But this mortality showed a greater percentage of death due to infection than to battle wounds. And it was a result of medical neglect, as well as poor immune systems, as well as lack of stamina, and also medical abuse at the hands of unqualified medical uh, personnel. Um, with regard to mortality, uh, in the North, 359,000, almost 360,000 were killed, another 246,000 wounded. In the South, 258,000 were killed and 200,000 wounded. Um, the Negroes in the North, um, 68,000 died from all causes, but only 2,751 died in action. The remainder died of wounds, uh, some of which were picked up peripherally due to action. Um, <clears throat> but their jobs were often to remove uh, injured or dead from the field um, and to uh, help with logistics um, rather than carrying a gun. Um, but most of them were died because of wounds or disease and almost a thousand were were actually missing. So uh, 180,000 uh, Negro troops served during the Union Army, or about 10% of all the troops in the North. Uh, there were quite a few uh, troops from the South as well who served, but we don't have those exact uh, numbers. That is many slaves who remained with their owners and fought and died with their owners. I want to share another um, 
video with you that will talk about the American Civil War battlefield. War medicine, we tend to think of some fairly common notions. We tend to think of relatively ignorant doctors hacking off the arms and legs of, of patients without really understanding why or really even needing to. Uh, we tend to have this idea that all of the Civil War hospitals were relatively filthy affairs, that they were dirty, that there was no understanding of sanitation. And we certainly think of people getting medications that by today's standards we just consider absolutely barbaric, things like lead or arsenic, which today we know are poisons. And because of that, I think we tend to have a skewed opinion of just how advanced or not advanced Civil War medicine was. And I think it helps to step back for a second and take a look at the reality and understand a couple of things about Civil War medicine. First of all, the conflict came about before we had what is now universally known as the germ theory. Most diseases were understood not to come from bacteria or from viruses as we know them today, but rather from bad air. If you would almost think of it, um, things that floated in the air. Now we know that bacteria will do that, but back then they were thinking more gases or poisons, poisons in the air, and they actually call that miasms. So when you have the miasmic theory of medicine, we're not talking about giving you a pill that will kill the germ or stop the bacteria or stop the virus in your body. We're actually talking about counteracting a poison. So using one chemical to counteract something in the body that's doing something else. And because of this, we tend to have a fairly negative view of Civil War medicine. But let's take the most common thing that's out there. Most people, if you go into any crowd and you say, what's the number one thing you know about Civil War medicine, the hands immediately go up and they say, well, amputation was the most common surgery, and that's in fact true. Let's analyze for a minute why. The bullets in the Civil War by modern standards were enormous. They were greater than half an inch in diameter, and some of them weighed upwards close to an ounce. And when you're talking about an entire ounce or a half an ounce or three quarters of an ounce of solid lead, moving at eight to 900 feet per second and having that cr crash into a bone in your body, what happens is you have a tremendous amount of crushing power. And that crushing power translates into bones that are not simply broken, but rather they're shattered. Now in today's modern world, that's not a problem. We can put you into an x-ray machine, take a look at where all the broken pieces went, remove them from your body and save your life. In the 19th century, however, there's so much dirt in the uniform that gets embedded into the wound, and there's no antibiotics to fight those infections. Infection is an immediate problem, and if we don't cut that arm or leg off, you're going to get an infection and it may well be fatal. Doctors knew this. The best possible way to save a life, the best possible way was to amputate the limb, get as much blood flow as possible to that limb by cutting off a large portion of it, and by doing that, we're hopefully gonna fight the infection or prevent it from happening and save the man's life. So amputation wasn't something done by ignorant doctors. It was something done by doctors who knew that it was the best possible way to save a life. It was also the quickest way, and that's important. If you have 100 men laying on the floor waiting for treatment, you could do an operation that takes longer that could save a life, but can the last guy wait that extra few minutes while you're doing the operation? Possibly not. So amputation not only saved the life of the man on the table, he also saved the life of the man who was waiting to get to the operating table. So when you think of Civil War medicine, don't just think of, of filth, don't just think of amputations, but think of other things. Think of the fact that those amputations saved lives. Think of the fact that, believe it or not, the hospitals were actually very sanitary, even by modern standards today. They were cleaned regularly. Understand that they invented a whole new dietetic system where diet was used, as we know today very well, diet was used to help the body heal itself. 
So improvements in sanitation and diet, along with the operations that were done in the Civil War, not nearly as barbaric as you think. In the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, we talk quite often about the idea that Civil War medicine is not what you think. If you look at the reality, you'll find out it's a lot better than most people think. Civil War medicine was really a revolution that brought us to where we are today. So you can see that um, it was um, a very, very difficult time to uh, be a surgeon in the Civil War. And uh, the fact that all the doctors in the Civil War, uh, certainly the white uh, doctors and, and black were, were surgeons. And um, wound care and amputations were um, much more common than we would hope for sure. Um, so during this period of time, what roles did blacks play with regard to medicine in the Civil War? So certainly we had the, the troops, these are some of the young uh, troop uh, members. And again, as, as was stressed, uh, they did have rifles. Um, it was noted that the troops, the black troops were often on the, on the wide sides or the periphery of the uh, uh, attack. Most, uh, uh, exposed to the environment and to the oncoming um, opposition. Um, but they fought um, admirably. Um, and uh, also many <clears throat> African Americans were ambulance drivers. And so they were injured uh, really in the process of moving the troops uh, to the field hospitals. Uh, Harriet Tubman, um, as we know, uh, was uh, the American abolitionist, and uh, from her work in helping slaves in the Underground Railroad, she transitioned actually to a Civil War nurse and um, was essential to the Union military as a spy and her knowledge of the surrounding areas uh, to blend into Confederate controlled uh, areas. She actually was eventually awarded a military pension for her service in the Civil War and was buried with military honors. Uh, Susie King Taylor is a, uh, a young woman who served in, as a 14 or 15 year old um, as a nurse. She was not a trained nurse at that time, but she had had experience and she was uh, the, a nurse with the 33rd um, uh, Union uh, um, unit and she was the only black woman to publish a memoir of her wartime uh, experiences. Um, she then worked for the Women's Relief Corps for women veterans of the Civil War uh, after her time of service. Uh, Martin Delaney, uh, MD, um, was another of the everymen. Um, we, many of us, I'm sure, have heard of Martin Delaney. And in fact, I went to Delaney Methodist Church in Gary, Indiana uh, as a youngster, but I didn't really know anything about Martin uh, Robinson uh, Delaney. Uh, of course, he was an abolitionist. He was a newspaper editor. He was a very close uh, friend uh, of uh, uh, Frederick Douglass. Um, he was classically trained. Um, and he decided that he wished to go to medical school and his credentials admitted him to Harvard Medical School. Um, he had two other colleagues who were also admitted in 1850. However, after one week of classes, the, the white students began a rebellion and stated that they did not feel comfortable um, having black students in the class with them and that they would devalue their education, uh, even though um, it was clear that these, these black students were quite uh, gifted uh, intellectually. Um, however, after a six month period of time with protest, uh, rather with um, 
yes, protests, but also with hearings uh, within the Harvard Medical School, Oliver Wendell Holmes and others um, indicated that uh, the black students would have to cease uh, as students at Harvard Medical School uh, because of the uh, disruption of the other students. Uh, the concern and sadness is that the majority of the students were actually um, in favor of them being there, but this vocal minority um, made a difference. So again, we, we have to be careful of the base because the base can disrupt life uh, today as well as back in 1850. Um, he was a Civil War major. Um, and this was before he actually became uh, a doctor. Uh, he became a doctor by apprenticeship. And he did live a full life. He died at age 63, 73, um, but he died of tuberculosis. So this is one of several of the doctors that we have studied who have died of, of tuberculosis. Dr. Charles Purvis was born free in 1842. Um, and uh, enlisted actually as a nurse. So he was a, a nurse at a contraband hospital in, in uh, Washington, which essentially was Friedman's Hospital. Um, and while he was uh, a nurse, he graduated from Western Reserve Medical School in 1865, and then moved to be a co-founder of Howard University School of Medicine and one of the fa faculty members. Of interest is that he attended uh, President Garfield after he was shot by an assassin. And then probably most famous in terms of the, the blacks in the military in the Civil War was Alexander T. Augusta, who was born uh, free in, in Norfolk, Virginia. He wanted to be a doctor, but was not allowed to, to enter any of the medical schools in the United States. So he moved to Canada and graduated from Trinity Medical College in Toronto began working as a doctor, and then came back and volunteered service um, uh, during the Civil War. And uh, then <clears throat> he also uh, was very involved as one of the early faculty members of the Howard University School of Medicine. Dr. Anderson Ruffin Abbott was a student of uh, Dr. Augusta, and he also served as a civilian surgeon at the Freedman's uh, Hospital um, between 1863 and 1865, um, and also attended uh, President Lincoln uh, when he was when he was shot. Uh, he did return to Canada in 1866 and continued his practice there. The um, American Medical Association. Uh, the American Medical Association is a federation. Um, so that it, it um, has societies, it has state organizations, and those societies are the uh, organizations that make up the membership of the AMA. And so the AMA got around overtly discriminating against blacks by putting it off on the medical societies. So in 1870, the AMA declined to embrace a policy of non-discrimination and excluded all members of the Integrated Medical Society of um, Washington, D.C. And so this exclusion was achieved through selective uh, enforcement of membership standards. And Dr. Augusta and his colleagues who were faculty members at Howard were those physicians who had applied for the uh, Medical Society membership and, and were denied. Um, so looking back at the health status during and after the reconstruction period, there was a rapid deterioration of health status after the Civil War uh, due to the fact that the slaveholders severed their ties with their former chattel. And in, with the influx of, of people moving from the South to the North, as well as uh, in the South, there were crowded and unhealthy communities uh, with one quarter to one third former slaves dying during the first years of Reconstruction. So these high hopes of Reconstruction and making a life better uh, soon were found to be uh, on this level of health as well. Um, 
a uh, merely a pipe dream. Uh, the epidemics of smallpox, yellow fever, cholera, and the like were much higher in blacks. Uh, and we talked about childhood mortality. So this continued. So the children were two to three times uh, more likely to die, uh, black children were, than white. And tuberculosis was extremely high in African Americans. Um, these resulted from deficiencies of food, shelter, clothing, all the same problems that occurred during the time of the antebellum period and uh, earlier in slavery. Uh, however, uh, the Freedmen's Bureau hospitals, which were the only hope that many of these individuals had, um, while they were there to take care of patients, and at some point there were over 100 of these hospitals for a very brief period of time, they were unsanitary, they were crowded, and, and so uh, they were not really totally helpful in terms of of solving the health problems of, of uh, the newly freed um, black uh, persons. Um, in 1860, 300, 300 female physicians uh, existed. So within a, in about a 10 year period of time, um, there were 300 female physicians uh, that uh, um, developed in the United States along with 54,543 male physicians, all of whom were inaccessible to this growing black population. So even by 1920, there were only 65 African-American female physicians uh, in the United States. Rebecca Lee Crumpler was the first African-American female physician. And she, in 1864, uh, became the first and the only uh, graduate of the New England Female Medical College uh, in Boston, and she practiced in Boston. And um, after the Civil War, she did missionary work, and she was uh, one of probably one of the first black uh, doctors to actually write a book uh, on medical uh, discourses. This is the uh, school, the New England Female. Medical College, it only existed for 25 years. And as I said, Rebecca Lee Crumpler was the one and only African-American to matriculate. Rebecca Cole was the second African-American to receive a medical degree. And she did so from the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania in 1867. Uh, but both of them uh, preceded Howard University School of Medicine which opened in 1868 as the first historically black uh, medical school. Mary Eliza Mahoney was the first licensed African-American nurse, and this was in 1878. So again, there were nurses uh, through the years, and particularly in the Civil War, um, but that were African-Americans. Um, in the Civil War, most of the African-American women were cooks um, and uh, attendants. Um, but um, she was 33 years of age and, and 10 years after the beginning of her employment um, with the New England Hospital for Women and Children when she actually uh, became a physician. So what was the impact of, of changes in the health education institutions? during the Reconstruction period. This is extremely important, I think. Uh, we learned about the Freedmen's Bureau, but from the health perspective, uh, it was established by the successive acts of the Congress, uh, constantly working against the vetoes of uh, President Johnson. Uh, it was placed under the War Department. Originally, that was very important. In general, Oliver Otis Howard uh, was the founder and head of the Freedmen's Bureau and had extremely uh, big job. And he was uh, European, uh, uh, he was very concerned about the slaves and about the uh, inequalities of health. Uh, the Freedmen's Bureaus provided the only health treatment for freed blacks as well as Northerners. Uh, they came after the plant slave health system as we mentioned and the resources that were provided were not only for health, but also education, 
and schools. And as I mentioned, supporting about 100 hospitals. Um, this assisted uh, former slaves to legalize marriage and found uh, their relatives, and as was stated, it, uh, was dismantled in 1872. Uh, Freedman's Hospital uh, was actually that hospital, the first hospital that was formed uh, by slaves, uh, performed to treat the former slaves in Washington. And in 1869, it moved to the campus of Howard University. And on my right is, is the building of the uh, Freedman's Hospital that still exists and was a teaching hospital when I was a student at Howard. And my wife and my mother-in-law and many others probably on this call today were born at Freedman's Hospital. It was replaced in 1979 by the then new Howard Hospital. Uh, this is uh, Alexander Augusta again, who we spoke of. Um, and the success of the Freedmen's Bureau was also in providing education um, in some of the Union Industrial Schools. This one in Richmond, Virginia, um, helping young and old who, to learn to read or write. And there was modest success in providing health services for free slaves and, and Northerners but their circumstances of living were so, so severe that uh, it was, uh, as I said, a modest success. Um, also, the Freedmen's Bureau was responsible for developing uh, a university system, a college system, uh, which exists today. So actually Atlanta University, uh, the uh, predecessor of Atlanta Clark University, uh, Clark Atlanta University, was founded by the American Missionary Society with assistance from the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, and in the late 1870s, it began uh, BA degrees and supplied teachers and librarians uh, throughout the South. Uh, DeBoer, of course, served 23 years as a faculty member and uh, during his latter years was chair of the Department of Sociology. Fisk University in Jubilee Hall uh, was named in in honor of General Clinton B. Fisk of the Tennessee Freedmen's Bureau, um, it was con it convened its first classes in 1866. Uh, it was a beneficiary of the Freedmen's Bureau, and uh, the first students shared the experiences of slavery and poverty and poverty and ex extraordinary thirst for learning because they they lived and uh, they went to school in old slave. Uh, quarters and hospitals. Then Howard University as a medical school was founded in 1868. Um, the faculty members of, the, of Howard University uh, were eight in number, two were black, uh, Dr. Augusta and Dr. Purvis, uh, who we spoke of uh, earlier. And um, the uh, Meharry Medical College was founded in 1876 um, with the uh, support of uh, George Hubbard and the support of the Meharry brothers, a uh, family, a wealthy family that was befriended by, um, let me say one of the younger brothers had an injury because his, uh, his uh, carriage a wagon um, had an accident and he was thrown off and, that, and the uh, um, wagon was greatly uh, uh, destroyed, uh, or at least the wheels were destroyed. Uh, and he was rescued by a black family and taken to their home. And he was uh, uh, attended to, clean, fed. And the next day that family had fixed the wagon as well so that he could carry on. And the family never forgot. And when they had the opportunity, they were the philanthropists um, for the development of Meharry Medical College. And the importance of Meharry Medical College is that it served that 90% of Blacks who were in the South following slavery and who had not had the traditional opportunities for education and had need for remedial classes, longer terms, um, and the like. 
but Meharry has had a tradition which has continued uh, providing uh, primary physicians uh, throughout uh, the Southern uh, United States and along with Howard University uh, has been responsible for over half of all the uh, African-American uh, medical students. Certainly at the time I was in school, now that's not the, not the case. Um, so lastly, I was just going to remind you that there were a number of black medical schools, uh, which probably many of us did not know about unless you lived in these cities. Uh, Howard was the first and uh, medicine and surgery in Memphis was the last in, in 1907. Um, and um, following the Abraham Flexner report in 1910, um, commissioned by the uh, government and the Carnegie Foundation, um, it was determined that all of, most of these schools, if they had not already ceased uh, providing education, had to discontinue providing education uh, because uh, their, their schools were felt to be substandard. And that was interesting because there were many of their graduates actually passed state boards, um, but it was, uh, there weren't that many graduates, sometimes two, four, eight, six uh, graduates from these schools. Uh, but even though some of the students did well, uh, the schools financially and with regard to faculty and facilities uh, were not able to thrive so that the Flexner report um, signal the uh, death knell for those uh, medical schools. So I think at this point, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, we can uh, have questions and answers. Okay, there are a few questions and then uh, I'm sure there'll be more. Uh, one question was, was the profession to provide, provide proper health care yet another way for slave owners to show slaves they were inferior? Uh, would you mention, uh, would you uh, repeat the question? I want to make sure I got the first part correct. Yes. Was the failure to provide proper health care yet another way for slave owners to insinuate to slaves that they were inferior? Um, yes, uh, yes, and I think um, always to show slaves that whatever services they got were separate and they were not the same as what whites would get. Um, but there was also this um, dichotomy of trying to take care of the most healthy slaves uh, because as you can see, the, the longevity was, was not great. And, and they needed those slaves to be healthy to, to work, the, work the plantations. So um, I think um, that certainly the primary goal was probably to ensure the, that slaves knew that they were not on equal footing with whites. Is the, is the disparity of health care during the current pandemic a derivative of the history of inferior healthcare provided to the kidnapped slaves? Um, yes. Um, the, um, the, as I mentioned in that opening um, statement, and I just came across that forward, but when I read that, I said, this is amazing. This really pretty much in two paragraphs tells the whole story. And the fact is that um, um, there was a bit of, an advance in health with regard to blacks in the 18th century um, and 17th century uh, when there were fewer and when there, many of the blacks were in the North. And when um, um, the European uh, medicine uh, uh, input was great and the medical schools were beginning to uh, develop. Uh, but once the slavery developed, uh, rather once the plantations developed in the South 
and there was a migration of the blacks to the South, um, there was never any opportunity or any desire to have equitable health. So from the day that that began, that was exactly the time, as Bird and Clayton said, with the slave health deficit, that that blacks were on a zero going to negative, um, and certainly through the first half of the uh, 19th century. And so there has not been the opportunity to catch up yet. Um, I have a lot more that I could discuss with you, including the, the founding of the National Medical Association in, eight, in uh, 1895, uh, which was, was a result of trying to provide better care for uh, African Americans that have been neglected for, for generations uh, in the United States. But the social determinants of health that we see today um, and the problems um, that exist and have been uncovered by COVID-19 are an exact and, de and definite um, evolutionary um, finding from the slave health deficit. Long answer, but that it's, I agree that this is all tied together. As my daughter said, it all goes back to slavery. Randall, this is Gus White. May I make a comment? Can you hear me? How are you? Yes. I, I'm good, thanks. I'm good. I just, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you and give you my highest accolades for a phenomenal uh, amount of research, absolutely phenomenal amount of work that you have uh, reviewed and presented so, so beautifully. And, and uh, equally as important to that, I think, is that I hope there are some very well-structured plans to allow the full educational value of this work to be presented to uh, historically black institutions and also to uh, the overall medical profession in whatever way we can. But it, it's, it's so important, it's so relevant, and it's so beautifully uh, organized and presented. So I just want to make a shout out for making sure that we disseminate this and make it available to others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gus. And, and Gus uh, probably is known to many of you on the call. Uh, Gus is a professor of orthopedic surgery emeritus at, at Harvard. And uh, he and Alvin Crawford, who are both on the call, are uh, historically outstanding. African-American orthopedic surgeons who are my colleagues, as well as, as my mentors. So that, uh, uh, but thank you, uh, Gus. And it, it brings a point that um, I have uh, really decided <clears throat> that I'm going to spend the time that I have, you know, particularly since I don't have any music or anything else to do right now, um, I'm gonna spend the time that I have in working with the historically black colleges and, and universities and particularly for the four medical schools and and making sure that we get as much knowledge out there that we can in terms of the importance of the schools. Because uh, certainly those of us who have been successful uh, could not have done so without our, the schools and without um, standing on the shoulders of, of giants. Uh, the faculty that, uh, that I had at Howard was unbelievable. So <clears throat> I appreciate your, your thoughts and your recommendations and uh, I will try to carry forth with this work. Randy, can you hear me? Yes, I can. How are you, Al? I'm fine. I, I second Gus in that this is just tremendous. It's amazing now. This, this is medical history. Uh, in Ohio, black history is not even taught to kids in, in schools, and this is just phenomenal. One thing that comes out of it, as we're getting now an initiative in Cincinnati, is to try to recruit more African-American males into medicine. And to know the history of, there's an article out of Oakland, perhaps two to three years ago, that talked about the response of middle to older age males doing better if they had a black physician taking care of them. And I think it all relates back to the distrust of the slaves and their forebears, the people who felt that perhaps 
they wouldn't they they were not trustful of the white physicians and the fact that they were experimented on and now i think it's really important that we continue to pursue uh, African-American males, as well as women, but specifically as we're finding ourselves uh, susceptible to diseases at a greater rate and suffering from one neglect, one uh, uh, failure to, to trust the system as it goes and to be compliant with it. So this is unbelievable history, and uh, I second that you should try to get it out to everyone possible. And I think with electronics and video units that we have now, it's capable, you're capable of doing it. And I can only congratulate you for this unbelievable presentation. Thank you very much. And we are working, um, and many of us here in Sarasota, Dr. Merritt, Dr. Hill, uh, our group, the Gulf Coast Medical Society, um, as well as our other organizations, uh, the Greek organizations, uh, Boule, uh, Lynx, everyone is working on this pipeline uh, issue in terms of working with students. And, and my goal is that we have at least one student of color from Sarasota Bradenton who graduates from medical school every year. Because I think that's extremely important that they come back and practice in this area. The, the, the patients here deserve it. And those of you who are here now and who have lived in other parts of the country um, understand um, what it means to have a shortage of uh, African-American uh, physicians. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I've been asked, uh, is there a primary doctor, is there a dermatologist, there, is there this, or is there that? Um, who is African-American? Who will understand my problems and my issues? Uh, or even um, uh, Hispanic uh, physicians as well, uh, that I've had to say, well, you know, we don't have anyone in that particular area. Uh, well, you'll have to go to Tampa, you'll go to Miami or, or whatever. Um, so it's, it's, it's a challenge, uh, but we have to keep, keep pushing uh, because there is no question that the outcomes are better uh, with patients who have that trust. And um, I, I learned that in 30 years of practice in, in Gary, uh, where I had a multicultural practice, no question. But I had a very substantially African American practice and a practice of people who trusted me. Uh, Randall, this is your boy Ray. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. How are you? Good. I am so proud of you uh, being a fellow Garyite, and I want to uh, add my kudos to the kudos for your magnificent presentation. I suggest strongly that you uh, compile uh, this marvelous lecture when you get the time, and I know that you're busy, in a book. I would certainly support that and put it all over the world. Uh, secondly, I have a question, if you don't mind. Uh, I'm concerned about the significance of Margaret Sanger being so prominent in the eugenics movement, and also the fact that most abortion clinics are in black neighborhoods. And I would like your thoughts on that. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for your, your comments. And um, I think, um, of course, Margaret Sanger was referred to uh, in the video as the uh, founder of uh, Planned Parenthood. Um, I think a major part of the problem is, is what I just mentioned that uh, there's a lack of uh, clinic, lack of clinicians, a lack of physician uh, specialists in obstetrics and gynecology in many communities um, to serve these patients. And, and many of them have to receive their primary gynecological care at uh, Planned Parenthood. So it's not just abortion. I think many of them uh, receive uh, a lot more care and a lot more compassion at those institutions than they would at, uh, at some of the major hospitals or clinics. And, uh, and in the absence of, of physicians who relate to them or who care for them, um, that's necessary. Um, interestingly enough, um, we all know Dr. Washington Hill and uh, Dr. Hill's twin brother, George, is, is on our board for the Cobb Institute. But uh, I remember when Washington came 
to Sarasota, and he came because he was a uh, was a leading physician in terms of perinatology, uh, or you know, complicated pregnancies and the like, and came recruited by Sarasota Memorial Hospital. But he didn't really come recruited to take care of black people. Um, and, and yet he has had, and through the clinics at Sarasota Memorial, as well as the healthcare clinics, ironically, the majority, if not all of the obstetricians are African-Americans. And so that's where the, where the bulk of the people in the community in Newtown and the like receive their obstetrical care. And so it just says that cultural uh, sensitivity is going to to be extremely important all across our society and that uh, we need of course to do a better job of providing more choices uh, we need more uh, women obstetricians um, certainly that's coming um, but um, all of these um, things that happen are not by accident and um, so we have, to we have to provide the care in whatever means that we can and at a, a culturally sensitive uh, care, particularly for women and, and children. Uh, final thing I would say is that one of our main health disparities now that many of you probably understand is uh, maternal uh, and child uh, mortality. And it's amazing that there's been an increase in black maternal mortality over the last decade, as recently as the last decade. And so I'm worried that with the onslaught of, of uh, criticism about the Planned Parenthood programs and the inability of people to, to access care, um, and there's a significant parallelism to the, uh, to the uh, antebellum period where you had increasing populations and decreasing access to care. Yes, for one more question before I stop the recording. No more questions? No Go ahead, Marion. Stop the recording. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. You, you were going to ask a question before you stop. Go ahead. Oh, no, I didn't have a question. I was asking if anyone else had a question. Oh, we're all I'd, I'd, appreciate, I'd appreciate a question from a non-MD. Yeah. Uh, I, <laughs> I have a question. I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to make my presentation so, so, so doctory. You know, I, I really was trying to have a conversation, and I hope it came across that way. But Bob I know everybody. I have a comment. I have, I have a question and a statement. This is Ron Mason uh, speaking. Um, having worked at Planned Parenthood uh, Federation of America for a long time, um, uh, many years, um, certainly the, the issues that you've pointed out are issues that we've known or we've come to know based on our practices and cultural kind of assimilation that we've gotten from our forebears. One of the things that struck me was that where we come to understand these kinds of things, there's the larger population that doesn't understand the impact from the historical aspect to how it's impacting us today. So where we talk about wanting to have our folks understand this and understand our history, I think it's just as important to have the mainstream, if you will, medical professionals to understand the nature of that historical impact to the very practices that they're doing today. So can you comment? Uh, yes, I can. Um, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, I'm involved with the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons um, as a, in a leadership role there with the uh, Gladden Society, which is our, <clears throat> our group of African-American board certified orthopedic surgeons. And it has of historical uh, importance as well, over 20 years old. And we've represented diversity, inclusion, uh, and all the like in the academy throughout our existence. And after many years of having difficulty, the academy 
is, is having significant difficulty uh, getting its arms around the issue of diversity and inclusion. And we've had meetings with the academy uh, leadership and in those meetings, we've explained to them that wanting to, wanting to solve this problem and, uh, you know, is a little uh, more difficult than uh, just making a statement that the organization has to really uh, step outside of itself and quit trying to find solutions inside and seek cons consultation from outside. So we're, we're encouraging the academy, like a Fortune 500 company, to bring in uh, diversity specialists to, to speak to the, um, all the members of the academy, all these physicians who know everything, who okay. don't need to have anybody tell them anything um, and, do not, and totally uh, devalue the importance of culturally competent care, and particularly as it relates to African Americans. Uh, orthopedic surgery is probably one of the most um, conservative specialties in all of medicine. And so we, we recognize that it's important to hold their feet to the fire in terms of learning uh, about diversity and inclusion and how important it is uh, by, from any five, Fortune 500 company, any university can provide that information. We have the same problem on our medical staff at Sarasota Memorial Hospital. Um, the talk that I gave in 2019 was the first talk I gave at Sarasota Memorial Hospital, and I've been here since 2005. And Dr. Washington Hill was the person that invited me to give the talk, not the chief of staff, not the, not the administrator, not anyone else that I was in practice with before in my former practice. Um, it, it's as if, you know, my interest, the interest of African Americans and the like, um, doesn't really exist um, in, in, in that world. And so I think at this point, we just have to intrude upon these very um, um, settled environments and taking advantage uh, of <clears throat> the unsettling times that we have now <clears throat> to make sure that individuals who are our colleagues hear the message. And we don't need to go to Howard and Meharry to, to give this talk. Anybody that went to Howard could give the talk I just did today. But we need to talk to the people of the University of Miami, the University of Florida, Florida State, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and the like. So I agree with you. Uh, we're going to have to have that discussion. Dr. Morgan, I, yes. uh, I'm wondering about the Surgeon General of the United States and whether, number one, you would have any you, you, you've had any relationship with him of any kind, and whether or not he could be lobbied to, to uh, try to uh, encourage your, your curriculum, what, what you just pr presented to us, to all of the medical schools in the United States. Well, interestingly, you should say that. So um, there are several yeses. Uh, yes, I know the Surgeon General. Um, two, the Surgeon General is actually um, a Hoosier. Uh, he spent a great deal of time in Indiana, went to Indiana University School of Medicine. Um, he's a colleague and a uh, student of uh, Dr. Virginia Kane from Indianapolis, who's one of my colleagues and is the uh, department, is the chair of the uh, the department head of Marion County Health Department. Um, and I was with him almost to the day a year ago at the National Medical Association opening ceremony in Honolulu. Uh, he's a very uh, affable person and, uh, a, and a very intelligent, uh, well-meaning uh, person. And he has been very open to being involved with the NMA uh, particularly with this COVID-19. Um, uh, initially, NMA was, uh, was sort of a first um, anchor, shall we say, into the Black community. So, so we have a relationship, and, and he has a concern. Of course, he's, he's in a very difficult spot right now, but he is accessible. 
um, and it has actually reached out to the National Medical Association for some collaborative efforts. And so this, this may be one of those collaborative efforts and I appreciate the suggestion. So uh, I, I will certainly uh, follow through with that. Thanks. Randy, uh, hi, I've really enjoyed all of this and I appreciate your work. Uh, working with uh, a historical and genealogy society as one of my things that I'm really passionate about. I think it's really important for this information not only to be taught at medical schools, but it's really important if this effort is pushed down at an elementary school and also high school. Because I think the earlier you start with putting the truth out there and the facts out there, I think the better this world will be and it would help moving forward. But just learning about a lot of this history in medical school, uh, they are too old. And a lot of times people form their own opinions. So I think it's really important for us to really kind of push the educational system to make sure that all of the information is taught and that history is about all history and not just some of the history. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. That's Deborah, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Randall. Thank you. Yes. Hi. You're muted, Lois. You're muted. You're muted. Okay. Am I muted now? No, you're okay now. Okay, thank you so much, Randall, for uh, presenting this. But as you were listening, the medical schools, it reminded me of Homer G. Phillips, which, which yes. was a training hospital. And I lived down the street from that hospital. And it was, as a young uh, girl growing up, it was very impressive to see the young African-American young men, and it also trained um, nurses. And one of your friends and our friend, uh, Clarence uh, uh, Boo, <laughs> was trained there. It's no longer in existence, but it was one of the training centers for physicians. Uh, so interesting that you should mention that um, I can tell you a little secret now that um, this uh, talk that I have prepared, mm -hmm. um, I can probably give at least as long as David gave his uh, presentation or not. But the point is that the hospitals, the black hospitals really developed from 1891 on into the first 30 years of the 20th century. And I would have thought that there would have been more of these black hospitals before 1900, but they really weren't. They came about after the NMA was founded and after 1900. Uh, and then it went from like a handful to 170 or more black hos uh, hospitals. Um, and so I actually had given a talk at Morehouse about two years ago uh, to the uh, residents at Morehouse. And uh, it was on the hospital system, the black hospital system, and its importance because during that time, black uh, physicians had nowhere to train uh, besides black hospitals. Uh, they were not able to train in majority hospitals. And so it, it was totally essential that we had Provident and we had uh, Homer G. Phillips and Friedman and, uh, um, you know, and, and those other black hospitals throughout the country. Dr. Morgan, I think Jim Stewart wants to uh, make a comment and then we'll stop our recording and open it up for general comments as long as you can, uh, can stand it. Jim? Randall, I just want to echo everything that everyone else has said about the quality of your presentation and the importance of your work and the way in which you've lived your life here, not simply in Sarasota, but throughout your medical career. And I want to thank your colleagues who are also on the call as well as all of the medical personnel who are uh, here in uh, Sarasota who retired here and who remain committed to the community. 
And I want to thank you, David, and, and our technical staff for such a wonderful summer of inspirational and educational opportunities. And we look forward to finding ways to continue this in the future. And uh, whatever we can do to help you, Randall, as you package this presentation for schools and for whatever other uh, ways you want to use it, know that Minnesota Solid is behind you. So thank you again. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah.